So what I'm going to do in this uh, next session is first of all explain why integrity protection really matters. Okay, I'm going to give, do a little case study of IPsec and show you that if you just have encryption, like uh, CDC mode in this particular case, um, all security is lost, or at least can be lost. Okay, and this is um, I'm going to just pick out one attack from a kind of a long line of work that, that I was involved with, where we were analysing IPsec, and then I'm going to switch focus and talk about TLS security. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to TLS and give you kind of a TLS in a nutshell. And I'm going to specifically focus on why certain details really matter for security. I'm going to talk about why IVs in CBC mode need to be random. By showing you what happens if they're not random. By showing you an attack based on predictable IVs in TLS. And that leads all the way up to something called the beast. Uh, have you all heard of the beast? It's pretty scary sounding, isn't it? It turns out that the guys who invented the beast, uh, Duong and Rizzo, um, actually came up with a name first and then retrofitted the, uh, the words to the name. So it stands for something like blockwise adaptive something something. I don't even think it means anything. But there's an important point here. If you come up with a cool name for your attack, people will refer to it. Right? So it helps, the mar helps with the marketing to have a cool name for your attack. That's why we call this other attack that I'll talk about this afternoon, we call it Lucky 13 because it sounds cool. Right? Not because it's anything meaningful. Well, it kind of is, but it isn't really. Okay, so let's talk about IPsec. So uh, I'm going to assume that most of you have not really seen any of the IPsec details before. And I'm going to tell you, I think, just enough, I hope, uh, to, so you can get your head around this attack. So IPsec is about protecting IP datagrams or IP packets. These are the kind of fundamental units of data flying around the internet, right? I mean, who, who here has not done a course on, uh, say, basic networking? Oh, quite a lot of you. You're the mathematicians, right? <laughs> okay, cool. So there, is, there are these things called IP packets. No, let's go back. There's this thing called the internet, right? <laughs> and on the internet, we're transmitting data around, and all the data gets sent in these little chunks called packets. Okay, just sequences of bytes flying down optical fibers and wireless and, and copper cables and all kinds of stuff, okay? So there are these things called packets, and we might want to encrypt them and attempt to protect them for obvious reasons. Um, and so IPsec does that for you, and it's an incredibly complex set of standards that define IPsec. So it was originally defined in the mid-90s, 95, in a sequence of 12 RFCs, 12 standards. So if you add up the page count, it's more than 300 pages to define IPsec. So if you're an insomniac, this is, this is great, man. this is fantastic. And, um, well, actually, that was the version 2 of the RFC, so those were 98. And then they redid it all, and it got even longer. Um, less documents, but longer in total, and that's version 3, and those were published in uh, 2005. So RFCs are, are these kind of internet standards, if you like. They're, they're generated by an organization called the IETF, which grandly stands for the Internet Engineering Task Force. And they're, they're responsible for engineering the internet and writing standards for the internet, okay? And the internet's that thing for the mathematicians. It's that thing you use to, to surf the web, yeah? Okay, so um, IPsec is kind of kind of disappearing a little bit, but it's still very widely implemented. It's in every major operating system. It's in lots and lots of networking hardware from Cisco and Juniper and I can't say it, how Huawei. How Huawei, how 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 we how we thank you. So they all they all have IPsec implementations. Sorry? No, you don't get a chocolate for that. Oh, there's a chocolate available, right? We're in a new session. There's one chocolate available. So think about your questions. Okay. Um, it's quite widely used, but kind of hidden in the network, in the kind of core of your network, where end users typically don't deal with IPsec. So, um, IPsec provides two kind of major modes of use, transport mode and tunnel mode. And we're going to focus on tunnel mode here. And it also provides different ways of doing uh, integrity protection and, confident and encryption, right? Or providing integrity protection and confidentiality services for data. So there are two major protocols, AH and ESP. And the ESP is the one that we're going to look at here. Okay, AH is kind of becoming redundant. All AH does is provide integrity protection, no confidentiality. And that's not generally what you want when you're using IPsec. You want some confidentiality as well. Okay, so tunnel mode is about protecting entire IP packets, the header of the packet and the payload of the packet. And what we do is we treat that entire IP packet as a sequence of bytes, and it becomes the payload of a new IP packet. Okay, so we're kind of encapsulating, we're putting one packet inside another packet and we're doing the encryption. So here's a picture, uh, I don't think it animates, no it doesn't. So here is our, here's the internet, the fluffy cloud. 
okay? It's, it's, it's a cloud because nobody really knows how it works, right? It's, it's kind of like this amorphous blob that nobody really understands. Um, here's a computer or a host that wants to talk to another host on the network, and they're producing IP packets, and IP packets have this structure, you have a header and you have a payload, okay? And the header contains things, but we'll see in a little while exactly what's in the header, but it contains things like IP addresses that enable you to get the packet from here to here and back again if there's a reply. Okay? And the payload contains the stuff that you actually want to transmit, which might be, uh, well, in, in, in many cases it will be a TCP packet. And inside the TCP packet will be an application layer message. So somewhere buried deep inside this payload is your credit card number. Okay? Or your password. Deep, deep, deep inside this payload. Okay? And in tunnel mode, what happens generally, not always, but, but mostly, do the, do, the, do the thing, okay? I should comb my hair. If I had more hair, I'd comb it or change my t-shirt into a shirt or something. Anyway. Okay, so we're going through, uh, in, in this tunnel mode deployment, what we have is something called a security gateway, and there's a matching security gateway over here. So Alice wants to communicate to Bob. Alice and Bob don't know anything about cryptography, okay? So they're going to rely on the security gateway to do all of this for them. So think of the security gateway as being a router on the network or a firewall or something like that, okay? It's a device through which all the traffic is going to flow. And what the security gateway does is says, aha, this is traffic coming from, from this machine, and it's going to that machine over there on that network, so I'm going to protect it using IP. <coughs> so on this gateway is a policy, right, which says for all traffic going from here to here, I want to use IPsec, and I'm going to use tunnel mode, and I'm going to encrypt, or I'm going to Mac, or I'm going to do some combination of encryption and Macing. Okay, and IPsec standards tell you exactly how to do that. So what happens then is that our original IP packet gets protected cryptographically, so it gets put inside a grey box, okay? And uh, this grey box might represent encryption, or it might represent integrity protection, or it might represent both of those services together. Okay, and, it's, and that's why it's not black, because we don't really know whether you can look inside it or not, right? Depending on what, exactly what services you have. So this whole packet here, with the header and the payload, becomes now the payload of another IP packet. Okay, so this, this is a new header, completely new header for an IP packet, and the payload of this outer packet is the original packet, but encrypted, or whatever. This gets sent across the network, and now the destination IP address in this header here is the IP address of the security gateway. So the packet reaches the security gateway, the security gateway looks at the, the packet, there's actually some information here at the start which tells it what key was used to do the encryption or the integrity protection. It doesn't tell it exactly what the key is, because that wouldn't be secure, but there's an assumption that these two security gateways have already shared a key, cryptographic key, and so this security gateway can undo the processing that was done by this gateway, and it can recover the original packet and then send it on to its destination. Okay, so here the endpoints don't know anything about IPsec, they don't, they don't know any cryptography, that's great because that's most users, right? Uh, and all the hard work is done by the security gateways on behalf of the users. Okay, so this is a very common deployment scenario for IPsec, sometimes called a VPN, Virtual Private Network. Because between, as far as this machine is concerned, you can talk directly to this machine uh, and they, they can look as if they're on the same network even though everything is going across the internet. Okay, and it's private because uh, everything is, well, potentially everything is encrypted by the original data. Okay? So a bad guy sitting out here, Tom the Devil sitting out here, uh, he just gets to see these packets going past and if, if this is encrypted, he can't see the original IP packet. He can't see anything about it. Okay, is it clear? Roughly? Good. Okay, so I need to tell you a little bit now about how encryption works in IPsec. And the protocol that does that is called ESP. And it comes in three versions, okay? So the protocol has evolved over time. Um, it provides one or both, but not neither, of confidentiality and, and integrity protection. So in version one, you can only do encryption. You only get confidentiality. And if you wanted integrity protection as well, you had to use AH, this other protocol that I'm not talking about. In versions two and three, they kind of realized that they needed integrity protection as well, and so they, they added that as a feature. As part, of, uh, as part of ESP processing, okay? So <clears throat> how does it work? Well, it's using symmetric encryption. Great, we know about symmetric encryption now and max. And usually, but not always, it's CPC mode. You can also use counter mode and you can negotiate things like uh, GCM and advanced encryption modes. So usually CPC mode, 
And the good news is that we're using random per packet initialization vectors. So we don't have an issue with uh, predictable IVs or anything here. And the typical Mac algorithm is HMAC with some hash function, SHA1 or MD5. Okay, so it's very standard cryptography by now. That's good. And here's how it looks on a packet. So this is a little bit complicated. Uh, the stuff in green here is your original IP packet, the inner header and the payload of that inner packet. Okay. And uh, we're going to uh, encapsulate that in an in a outer IP packet. So here's the outer IP header. And here's this thing that I mentioned that tells you what key to use. Okay, this is called the ESP header. And it contains a, a field here, which is 32 bits long. And it tells you, it's like a key identifier. It's a pointer to a key, which tells you at the receiver which key you should use for decrypting. Okay, so the receiver knows how to decrypt, assuming he has the key. <clears throat> um, when both Mac and encryption are used in, in, in ESP, we use an encrypt then Mac construction. Okay, ETM. Now, what do you remember about ETM in terms of security guarantees? What does it provide generically? AE, right? This is great. We get NCPA and we get NC text. We're in good shape, right? We've got good, strong security here. They made a good choice, it turns out. <clears throat> this is the only case in the entire series of lectures where we'll see where somebody made a good choice. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> at least initially. Uh, what I want to say next, oh yeah, so actually this is an example of an AEAD construction, authenticated encryption with associated data. Because look, the MAC scope, the thing that we MAC, includes the header here, but the thing that we encrypt is just the original packet. Okay, so we're, we've got this associated data, which is the header, which we're integrity protecting, but we also want to encrypt and integrity protect some other fields, which happens to be the inner, the inner fields here. We've also got this stuff on the end, ESP trailer and ESP off. The ESP off is actually the MAC value. It's the MAC tag. It gets put right on the end of the packet, okay? And this trailer field here is basically padding. And if I had more time, I would spend several hours telling you about uh, trailer padding and how you can abuse that to do attacks. I'm going to show you something much simpler, uh, just to demonstrate the, the point. So we're going to ignore really this field here. There's some padding rule to, to enable you to use CDC mode. Okay, and it's a little bit more complicated than normal. Okay, so this is the thing that we want to analyze. Can it? Yeah. What, why isn't the scope of the map all the way to the left? Ah, I think that's worth the chocolate. <laughs> Congratulately. Well, it's a bit early though, isn't it? It's a bit premature, but... It's kosher. <laughs> you tell me. That's it's, a good question. You can have a look at it. <laughs> yeah, but you don't get a second chocolate. <laughs> You, I, I guess it is because it's all written in Hebrew, so <laughs> oh, yes. that's a bit, is that, oh, that's not racist or anything, anyway, okay, um, okay, so let's go back in time, let's wind back to 1995, how many of you were uh, not born in 1995, anybody here not born in 1995, it's amazing, it's really scary for me. I, well, I wasn't born in 1995. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you know what I mean. <laughs> Okay, so ESP version one back in the day. Tom, Are you the which question? The IP oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got so carried away that I was going to get to show you an attack that I forgot to answer the question. So maybe I can ask you guys: Why does the Mac not cover all of the fields of the outer IP header? Go ahead. The outer IP header gets modified by the routers. Right. So uh, was it kosher? Is it good? I'll take it later. Oh, yeah, oh, okay. I want to review. I better check it. You only took one. Do I trust him? I don't know him. There's still two left. Okay, good news, good news. Okay, so the point is that when this packet's going across the network, okay, let's go back to this picture back here, across this internet, there are fields in that header that change. Like, for example, um, the TTL, time to live field, in the header. That's a, an 8-bit number, and every router that the packet goes through in the, in the network, for example the internet, that TTL field gets decreased by 1. Okay? Now this guy at the end, who's checking the Mac, he doesn't know how many hops the packet went through. So he doesn't know what the original value of the TTL field was. Which means that if the Mac here was computed on the outer header as well, this security gateway would have no, no way of checking or no way of knowing what was the original value of the field that was being, that was being used there. So he wouldn't be able to check the MAC. Okay? So there are fields that change in the headers 
They're called mutable fields, and you cannot include those in the scope of the integrity protection. Now, you could include all of the immutable fields, the ones that don't change, like the source IP address and some of the other fields, or the protocol field, for example. But it's a bit of a pain in the neck to work out which ones change, which ones don't change, and do a Mac algorithm that includes some fields but not other fields. Now, just to complicate matters, I will come to you in a sec, but I think I'm going to answer your point. Because uh, I'm, you know, we're on the same wavelength. Um, in AH, this is this protocol that only does integrity protection, which I'm not talking about, the fields in the header that don't change are protected by the Mac. Okay? So, but it's an absolute nightmare to implement, right? You have to know exactly, there's this header structure, it consists of five 32-bit uh, words, some of, the, some of those words change, some of the bits of those words change, and some of them don't, and you have to know exactly which do and which don't, and it just, it's just a pain. Okay? So, that's a long answer to a short question, uh, because it's complicated, I guess. Now, so why do you do it for AH and not for Ah, who, can, who knows? Who knows? Um, I was trying to figure out that. <sighs> yeah. I guess they, 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 they had a good, long, hard think when they did ESP version 2, and they decided that they didn't want to take on the hassle of, of protecting those fields, right? Okay, so blah, 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 let's go forward. So ESP version 1. So this didn't have any integrity protection. And actually then, pretty soon after, Steve Belovin at Columbia showed a series of attacks on ESP version 1 if you didn't use AH, if you didn't have any integrity protection. So he was the first guy, really, uh, to show that IPsec had vulnerabilities. But his attacks were a bit theoretical in some sense, right? He says, if you give me 2 to the 24 chosen plaintexts, then I can, I can recover one byte from TCP segments, and only from TCP segments, OK? Um, I mean, this breaks IPsec in our in CCA security model. But remember what I said about practitioners. You've got to show them all the plaintext in real time before they really pay attention to you, OK? So um, Belovin did a great job. It's theoretically interesting. Um, and actually, it did have an influence on, on the subsequent development of the RFCs, but not as much influence as you might hope for. So let's look at what happened next. What did IATF do next? Well, they said, we're going to include now integrity protection as an option in version 2 of ESP from 1998. Okay? There are problems if we don't have integrity protection. We don't always want to rely on using AH and ESP together. Let's put integrity protection into ESP. Okay? But, if you read the spec carefully, implementations must still support encryption-only mode. Why? Backwards compatibility. Backwards compatibility is the curse of cryptography. People will always do really bad, stupid, insecure things because that's what we used to do, and we still want to do what we used to be able to do. Okay? Okay, so in that sense, it's a compromise. And this is actually really common. This happens all the time in real-world cryptography. Everything's a compromise. What about ESP version 3? Well, it still allows encryption on the ESP, but it no longer requires you to support it. So a must has changed to a may, if you know the ITF terminology. Okay? And, and what's great is that the theoretical message, or the attack message, has got into the standard, and it actually gives you warnings about this attack from Belovin. Here I'm calling it the Belovin-Wagner attack, because if you read Belovin's paper, he says that the idea comes from Wagner. So he wrote a paper about somebody else's attack. That's kind of clever. I have to figure out how to do that. Uh, and it actually refers to the theoretical cryptography literature. It refers to, I guess, Bellarian Ampergrey or maybe Kravchik's paper to, to, to tell us why we need integrity protection. Fantastic, the message is getting through. Okay, but it still allows encryption only, and it says because this may offer considerably better performance. Okay, forget security, it's fast, right? And it might still provide adequate security, for example, when higher layer authentication or integrity protection is offered independently. Somebody else will do the work. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. So let me show you what that means. Basically what they're saying in this picture back here, I can get back there, is that, well, you know, maybe this payload was already integrity protected by the application or by TCP or something. So we're just going to do, if we can just do encryption at this level. Okay, and then, you know, it's going to be okay. I want to show you that's completely false. Okay, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, good. So that's all the setup. That's where we stand. Um, ESP version 3. Okay, so look, you know, it's well known that integrity protection is needed. Okay, theoretical cryptography has told us this for years. There are lots of high profile examples which I'd love to talk about. SSH version 1 is a complete disaster. 
wet, complete disaster, Kerberos version 4, broken, because they don't use integrity protection or they don't use it in the right way. And actually the experts knew, okay, all the IPsec experts knew that encryption-only configurations, you should avoid them if you can. And there are clear warnings in the MFCs, right? So what's the problem? Well, there's no problem. Is there? Well, this is from the administration guide from a well-known vendor, okay? This vendor is one of the largest network equipment vendors in the world. Five letters beginning with C. <laughs> okay? And this is historical now. This is from 2007, 2008. You can't find this anymore on the internet. But it was out there for years. So let's read it. If you require data confidentiality only in your IPsec number implementation, you should use ESP without authentication. Switch the integrity protection off. By leaving off the authentication service, you gain some performance speed, but lose the authentication service. It doesn't say you also lose the confidentiality service, it just says you lose authentication. It doesn't even say what authentication means. Okay? So we have the theoretical world, everything's good, everybody understands, and you have the real world, nobody understands a damn thing. Okay? And this is, this is the gap. Right? Huh? And that's Cisco. That's the old URL from 2008. You won't find that anymore. But if you look hard enough, you can find various online guides to how to configure your VPN in a totally insecure way. Okay? Okay, good. So, what do we have to do? We have to show that it's disastrously weak, right? So how do we convince practitioners that, that their system is weak? We produce attacks that consume reasonable resources. So 2 to the 24 is too high. It's not good enough, right? And we implement the attacks. We actually set up a network in the, in the lab, with switches and routers and servers and clients, and we make the work. We make it work. We make it work under normal network conditions. We try to do a ciphertext-only attack. No chosen plain texts, right? You just see some ciphertext, and then you can manipulate it and you can inject it into the network, and you try to make something <laughs> bad happen. Okay? And then finally, you hand over the plain text in the demo, right? So we actually did this uh, in, in the work I'm going to talk about back in 2006. We built a demo. We had this thing where you could enter your password, it got transmitted across the VPN, we would grab the ciphertext on the way, do the attack, and then out would pop the, cipher, out, out would pop the password. Okay, it's very surprising to, to people to see their password. <coughs> very surprising to us to see what password some people picked. To. That's another story. Um, <coughs> of course, we could have cheated, because they're entering the password on our machine, right? We can just, you know, we can cheat, but we didn't. <laughs> you sometimes, uh, that's a story for later, about being accused of cheating. I'll, I'll tell you that later this time. Okay, so reminder, how are we going to do this? How are we going to build this attack? Reminder about bit flip in the CDC mode. What do you remember? If we bit flip here, 0 to 1 or 1 to 0, some mask, we bit flip here. But it screws up this block. Okay, that's what we're going to use. So what we did in this paper, uh, this is myself and Arnold Dial back in 2006, is we came up with three different attacks on the Linux kernel implementation of encryption-only ESP in tunnel mode. We use this bit flipping, and what we do is we flip bits in the IV so that the packet that's been encrypted looks weird in some way. And then we see how the system reacts to that weird packet, okay? And it's going to send some kind of error message. And we're going to grab that error message and that's going to tell us something about plain text. So it's what you call a reaction attack sometimes in the literature. And it's a kind of a CCA attack. But there's no chosen plain text capability. We just grab a ciphertext and then we're able to decrypt it. Okay, let's look in a little bit of detail how it works. Okay, so here's, the, here's a little bit more detail about what an IP header looks like. I apologize if this is revision for some of you. It's complicated. There are all these fields in the header. It's, uh, it consists usually of five 32-bit words, but there are options fields as well. You can have up to another 10 32-bit words as well. And it's laid out in a particular way from 0 to 31 in the bits here. You have a 4-bit version field, okay, this will be 4 for IP version 4, uh, various other things, and I just want to pick out a couple of the fields that, that, that are important. So there's the protocol field, and the protocol field contains a number, it's 8 bits, and it tells you what's in the payload. So if the payload was TCP, for example, then the value of that field would be 06. If it was ICMP, it would be 01, okay, that's hex. Yeah? If it was UDP, it would be 17. X, O, X, 17, okay? So there are particular values that that field can be. There are particular protocols that, but there are particular values of that field which are actually undefined. 
There is no protocol with number 217, for example. Okay, that's decimal now, right? There, there, there is no protocol corresponding to that. So if you receive a packet as a, as a computer on a network that contains a protocol field containing 217, what are you going to do? You're going to say, hey, I don't recognize this protocol. And you'll send an error message back. And you'll send error message back to the, uh, the, 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 the host of the network at this address, the source address. This is where the packet came from, and you're going to send the error message back there. Okay? And it's called an ICMP uh, protocol unreachable error message. Okay? And we'll see in a minute what that error message contains. Okay? <clears throat> right. So that's the protocol field. Then there's this thing here. This is a 16-bit field called the header checksum. And this is the ones complement sum of the 16-bit words of the header, including any options. So this is meant to detect errors that have happened during transmission of the packet. In, in modern networks, that really doesn't happen very much anymore, but it used to be a problem. So you have this 16-bit value here, and basically the receiver, the first thing he does when he's, check, when he's processing a packet is he checks, does this, does this uh, checksum have the correct value? And if it has the wrong value, you throw the packet away without any error message. Okay? You don't want to generate error messages about packets where there's just been a, an accidental error in the message. Now think about this. We're going to be doing bit flipping. We're going to be flipping some of these bits around in the header. We're going to have to make sure that the header checksum ends up being the right value when we've done those bit flips. Okay? So we're going to have to have some mechanism for correcting the checksum <clears throat> to, to the correct value. And then finally, the source address, well, we mentioned this already, the source address is an IP address, 32 bits, and it tells the receiver where this packet came from. And you need to know where the packet came from so you can send any reply. Okay? This you know, might contain, the, the payload might contain an HTTP GET request for a web page. You want to be able to send a reply back to the, to the appropriate IP address. <clears throat> and also send error messages back. Okay, so that's everything you need to know about IP. Let's now look at the attack. Okay, so here is our CBC mode uh, ciphertext that we grabbed off the wire. It consists of an IV and then some ciphertext blocks, which, you know, there's lots of them. I'm only looking at the first few. And what we know is that the corresponding plain text down here actually starts with uh, five 32-bit words that correspond to the IP header, right? Because this is the, the plain text here is the inner IP packet in IPsec. Remember? We're encrypting this whole packet. So it starts with an IP header. And here I'm assuming that we have a 128-bit block cipher. So think AES. Okay? In fact, the bigger the block size of the block cipher, the easier these attacks are. Okay? It turns out because it, the bigger the block size, the more of the header fields are packed into the first block. And what do you know about the first block? Everything. You, you can change without corrupting anything. Right? By bit flipping in the IV. Okay? So the more stuff that's in this first block, the better for us as an attacker. Because we can, we can play around with more stuff. Okay? 128 bits is enough. Doesn't the uh, packet actually start with the IV in, in the, in, when it's encapsulated? The ciphertext does, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The ciphertext includes... The IV is explicit in the ciphertext. You're absolutely right. But if we bit flip in those bits, yeah. then we, we can yeah. create changes in the underlying plain text. So let's work, we're going to bit flip, okay, it should be obvious by now. We're going to focus on this stuff here. We're going to flip bits in the IV in those positions, and that's going to bring about changes to the protocol field and to the source address. So the idea is we're going to try and make the protocol field into something that's not valid, that isn't recognized by the receiver. And we're going to try and change the source address into maybe the address of the attacker. Okay? If I change this source address into the attacker's IP address, what does that mean about uh, any replies? Where will they go? They'll go to the attacker, right? In fact, we don't even need to do that, but imagine that's what we're doing here. Of course, we're going to have to do something to the checksum, because we've got to get the, the checksum to be the correct value. So we, mod we modify this field and this field, we better make sure that the checksum still is the correct value. That's linear. Sorry? That's linear. It's not linear, unfortunately. So here, these modifications are XORs. But the checksum is calculated using ar arithmetic, mod 2 to the 16 arithmetic. So you have carries to deal with. So it's a little bit nasty, right? But if you make a single bit flip here, and maybe a single bit flip here, and you do them in the correct positions, then they actually cancel each other out. And you don't need to worry about the checksum. The checksum will still have the correct value. 
And in general, you can you could try all two of the 16 possible values for the checksum by doing all possible bit flips here in the IV. That would be kind of ugly. It would be a 2 to the 16 attack. You can do much better. In fact, for the attack, you need at most 17 trials to build something that has a correct checksum. Okay, so checksum correction is a bit nasty, but you can, you can solve the problem. Okay, so we've done this. Now let's see what happens. So here's our scenario. Here's Tom. Still not looking very happy. So here's our packet. It goes through the security gateway, it gets encrypted. So now the gray box is ESP encryption, encryption only. <clears throat> the attacker intercepts it. He does the bit flipping that I explained. Okay, so he's grabbed the packet off the wire, he's done his bit flipping, and now he re-injects it into the network. So what happens, uh, so I've done this in red now to indicate that some of the fields have changed. Okay, so what happens when this reaches the security gateway? This packet. It gets decrypted, yeah, uh, and the security gateway will extract, what does he extract? He extracts this, modified packet, okay? And assuming that the checksum is good, then this packet will just be forwarded, okay? We didn't change the destination address, so it's still going to go to the same place, okay? Um, if the checksum was bad, then at this point the security gateway would just throw the packet away and the attack would, would, would fail. So we have to get the checksum right. Okay, so now what happens when this packet's received by the end host? Probably wrong protocol. Right, we changed the protocol field to be something that the receiver wasn't expecting. Not only was he not expecting it, he doesn't even know what it means. So at that point, okay, so we simplify the picture for a moment, at that point, he generates an error message, an ICMP error message. And the beautiful thing about ICMP is it tries to be helpful. Okay, it says, well, I'm going to tell the source as much as I can about this packet to help him diagnose what went wrong so he doesn't make the same mistake again. Okay, so actually the ICMP message contains, okay, a header and it contains as much of the original packet as it can squeeze in. Okay? Well, kind of. It depends on the implementation. So in Linux, you include up to 576 bytes of the original packet here for diagnosis purposes, including the header and the payload. Okay, and I've put it in yellow because it's encapsulated inside the ICMP message. It's the, it's the payload of the ICMP message. It's not encrypted. Okay, it's just in clear. Now, where is this going to go? This reply to the modified source, right? Which is yeah, the attacker. Now, the thing is that um, this is where it gets a bit tricky. So this is now going to be sent by this, uh, by this host. It's going to go to the security gateway. And in Linux, the security gateway doesn't do anything with this packet. It just says, well, this is a packet for, for this dude. It looks fine to me. I don't need to protect it with IPsec because it's outside of the tunnel. It's outside of the retail. So this gets sent in the clear, passed through the gateway to the attacker. Okay. <coughs> Now, what does the attacker have? He has, well, not quite everything, because he only gets part of the payload. Okay? But maybe your credit card number was in that part of the payload. Or if it wasn't, it doesn't really matter, because what you can do is by playing the game where you, uh, let's go back a second, da -da, here, by, instead of just bit flipping, if you chop off the last blocks of CBC mode and put on the blocks that you want to get decrypted, maybe the first block's garbled, but the rest of the blocks will decrypt properly. So by being a bit careful about what you put on the end of your, of your, of your, in, of your injected uh, ciphertext, you can get arbitrary chunks of your packets decrypted. Okay, and then you can automate this and build a tool that basically decrypts everything for you, more or less in real time. Yes? Oh, okay, so <clears throat> I don't really have a, uh, I'm not very good at drawing pictures, so I will attempt to do that. Um, Basically, the idea is that uh, instead of just flip, bit flipping in the header, like we did here, uh, here, we just bit flipped here, I'm going, to, I'm going to keep C1 and C2, and then in these positions, whoops, C3 and so on, I'm going to put my target ciphertext blocks from the stream, from somewhere else in the packet, okay, from my target packet that I want to get decrypted. Now, because of the way the CBC mode decryption works, if this is, if this is C27 followed by C28, then C27 won't decrypt properly because it's preceded by C2, but C28 will because it's preceded by C27. Yeah? 
So I can, I can kind of uh, cut and paste my blocks in, into a packet and get everything decrypted. Okay? So it's dead simple, actually. Uh, okay, so this is this. Da -da -da -da. Okay, so yes, yeah, so the point I was making there was that you only get part of the payload here, and you might want all of the plain text data. So the way to do that is to do cut and paste. And so for every packet that he intercepts, maybe he has to inject three or four of these attack packets. The nice thing, though, is you can reuse, the, uh, you can reuse this header over and over again. So the first blocks can be the same, and just keep putting new blocks on the end until you get everything decrypted. Okay, so that's it. Uh, that's the attacking words, which we won't read now. Okay, so um, yeah, this is where I was talking about how much data you get back. So in Linux, you get back the whole header and you get 528 bytes of the, of the payload of the inner packet, which is now playtext, okay? And we made sure that we modified the, the source address in the original packet so that the, uh, the message does not pass through the IP sector. <coughs> I didn't make that modification so that, I mean, you don't know the actual source address because it's the internal address, it's not the yeah. gateway. Guess that it's 192.168.something or something. <laughs> Why not? Or, <laughs> it could be, yeah, so then you do an attack that way, right? So there's, there's, it's reasonable to know something about the internal IP addresses. It's not unreasonable to, to guess that they're class A private or something like that. Yeah. Question? Yeah. Can you go back to the drawing of the CPU? Oh yeah, sure, it's gonna take a minute, we can do that. <laughs> da, 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 da. This is the big flaw of PowerPoint, right? There you go. Okay, so if the source address and the information address are swapped. Yeah. Would that be uh, that? Yeah, that'd be, that would be problematic. So, um, <sighs> yeah, so if you try to then bit flip for the source address, <clears throat> um, you would end up destroying this block Okay, because you'd now be flipping here instead of an ID. And then this would be random, it'd be very unlikely to be a valid IP packet. So you would, you would mess up. Yeah, so are you suggesting that as a countermeasure? Because that's the kind of thing that people will try to, they, they start to wriggle and scream and say, oh, but if we did this, then we can stop your specific attack. Okay, because actually there's another attack that I've not shown you that gets around all of those kinds of problems by basically doing a kind of padding oracle attack instead, which, I, which I'll talk about later. So there are various ways of, this is only one attack, and there are many, there's a whole kind of suite of different ways of doing things. Oh. So all this uh, resistance to using the, um, the integrity, how, yeah. much, how much performance does it actually save? Uh, it's going to make it twice as fast, roughly, uh, if you use CBC plus HMAC. If you use a modern algorithm like GCM, then the overhead of the Mac is like 5% or something. I mean, it's tiny. Well, maybe, maybe it depends on if you have ASNI or not, but it's, it's pretty small. Hmm? In terms of speed? Yeah, order of magnitude, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, it's not great. Do you want to talk to us about Yeah, if you have ASNI, then HMAC is really slow. But if you're implementing AES in software, then they're about the same. It's like, you know, within a factor of two or three cycles per byte. What's the idea of returning the, uh, the plain text and not the cipher text as an error message? Oh, that's an interesting question. So let's go look at this picture again. Here, this guy is returning the error message. He doesn't even know what the cipher text is because the security gateway has decrypted. And we, this is just plain text. This is just a normal packet, but we've done this bit flipping in the header. So this, this chap here has no awareness of the... He doesn't even know the encryption is being used. He's just sending, he's just doing the right thing. The it's, security gateway could still have uh, used the same key in order to encrypt it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's a big assumption here, which is that for the ICMP error message that comes back, okay, we assume that the security gateway does not encrypt it because that packet does not satisfy the policy that the, the gateway is applying because the destination for that packet is outside of the, it's not in this network over here. Okay, so there's this interaction between the crypto and the policy that you need to get right. And it turns out that actually uh, there were rules in, in the ESP standard, or in, in actually IPsec in general, about how you should handle ICMP error messages. And if, you, if, if Linux had properly implemented those rules, then this attack would not work. But it did, because Linux didn't implement the whole of IPsec at that time. 
And in fact, if you try to read those rules, you will get a severe headache. Because ICMP is complicated, right? And particularly when, you know, there are, there are different rules for processing different types of ICMP packets, and it's just a disaster. But, but, but surely you would take your, um, <clears throat> the, the Linux machine returning yeah. the ICMP is actually um, at the endpoint and not the gateway. So why would the rules for IPsec be applied to the, the, to the packet here? Oh, so, that, that, yeah. So what's meant to happen in, in IPsec is that when the security gateway decrypts and produces this packet, it should compare this packet to its security policy. And now we see that the source address that it's got here doesn't correspond to a source address in this network. And it should say, well, that's a security violation, that's a policy violation, I'm going to throw away that packet. So the, this packet would never reach its destination, and you would never get the ICMP required. But this is getting a bit technical, I, I, I guess. I want to just get the idea across of how it works without getting into the details. Yeah? Is there some reason that the IV isn't protected by the MAC? There is no MAC here. There's no integrity protection. So nothing is protected by, by MAC. That's the whole point. Yeah. OK? Cool. In, in, in MAC then, in, sorry, encrypt then MAC in IPsec, when you do use uh, integrity protection, the IV is protected. It's covered by the Mac. So this, will, this won't work anymore. OK, keep going through these slides. Uh, anything else I want to say here? Not really. OK, so some characteristics. The attacks are not finding encryption keys, right? We're not breaking a block cipher here. We didn't compromise the security of AES. We're just recovering plain text. But that's you know pretty useful. <laughs> They're pretty efficient. Uh, you can run them almost in real time against the IPsec tunnel. So we did this on a 100 megabit LAN and, you know, yeah, you get your plain text back pretty fast. The attacks are ciphertext only. I didn't have a chosen plain text capability. I just grabbed ciphertext off the, off the wire, flipped some bits, and made something bad happen. Okay? No special operating conditions. Well, that's slightly a lie, actually, so let's move on. Um, okay. Here's the thing, this is what we were talking about just a minute ago. The attacks would fail if you did these post-processing policy checks on the packets that are coming out of the gateway. But the Linux implementation did not implement those at the time. So we thought we were done, right? We thought, victory, we've broken IPsec, we're good to go. We gave a great, a great um, Eurocrypt presentation, I must say that. It was fantastic. <coughs> I loved it. Okay, how did people react? Well, they said things like the following. Okay. Ah. We know about this. We don't care. You're too late because we've just published our new RFCs and we're not going to change anything. Okay, so we didn't really manage to affect the real world. This is all very well understood among the IPsec community and is not news. Okay, technically true because Bill Logan had already demonstrated there was a problem, right? But they were still allowing encryption only, and you saw that Cisco manual, right, which says, yeah, you can leave off the integrity protection. All it does is make it faster. Okay, this is a, a famous cryptographer, who I won't name, who says, I think the spec is, you can actually look this up because it's on some uh, mailing list somewhere, right? So get this into Google, you'll find out who it was. I think the spec is clear about the dangers of encryption without authentication, that's true. If anyone built implementations that negotiate encryption without authentication, then maybe they weren't paying attention closely enough. What does the RFC say? It says you must support encryption only. Okay, and then version 3 says you may support encryption only, and then Cisco says you should use encryption only, right? So the point is that people who write software don't necessarily read the spec, and the end users who configure IPsec certainly are not reading the RFCs. They have much better things to do with their time, right? So, uh, okay. Okay, so let's, let's uh, skip this, we've said this. Okay, now I want to come back to this point. Remember what the RFC says. We allow it still in version 3 because it might improve performance and because you might get higher layer authentication or integrity protection, okay, offered independently. Now what's wrong with this statement? Can anybody see? Think back to the attack. It won't get up to the application layer. To precisely, get... precisely. The attack works at the IP layer. The error message comes from ICMP, which is part of the IP layer. So this, this packet where we're supposed to be now checking the integrity at the application layer, but it never reached the application layer. The application layer never got to see it, or the, or the transport layer, whatever layer you like, okay? So this is wrong, 
Okay? You cannot hope to achieve integrity protection from a higher layer if the attacker can stop the packet from ever reaching the higher layer. So there's this really nice interaction now, I think, between crypto and networking, where you have to understand network layering and how packets flow across networks and how they get processed at different points in the network. And if you really want to understand how to, how to make these things secure, you have, to, you have to think beyond the security model and start to think about the deployment of the crypto. Okay. Is a question? No, good. Okay. So we went further. So we got this feedback saying, ah, but you know, you only broke the Linux implementation. It wouldn't work against a standards compliant implementation of IPsec. So uh, we did build an attack that worked against any RFC compliant implementation. But we looked at 10 different implementations and none of them were RFC compliant. <laughs> to the point where none of the, not that, that attack that we built wouldn't actually work in practice. Okay? Because nobody followed the RFC closely enough. So there's a game going on here, right, between the practitioners and people like me saying, oh, you can't, you, no, breaking an implementation doesn't count. You have to break an RFC compliant implementation, but we're not going to give you any of those. <laughs> but we, we, out, we outplayed them in this game. So what happened is we found an implementation Open Solaris, beautiful implementation, code was commented and everything, and it did properly implement their FCs, except it was a bug. Okay, so for, for this new attack to work, we needed uh, padding checks to be done properly. Okay, and this was something you could optionally select in Open Solaris to do the padding checks. But it turned out that when you selected it, IPsec stopped working. The reason was there was a bug in the padding check implementation. And what that tells you is that nobody had ever selected that option. Because if they would, they would then have filed a bug report and it would have got fixed. So we filed a bug report. And we got Open Solaris fixed and then we could break it. Okay. Now I want to be clear that, that of course Open Solaris knew we were doing this, right? We talked to them, they knew this was coming, they had lots of heads up about, about the attack coming down the wire. Um, but that's great, that was really good fun. Uh, and then what we did in this 2010 paper, this is with uh, Jean-Paul de Gabrielli, uh, is we, we, we said, well, hang on, if you reach Schneier, I'm going to Schneier bash again, okay? If you reach Schneier, Schneier says that uh, the order of encryption and authentication in IPsec is wrong. You should Mac first and then encrypt. He says that. So how could you possibly do that in IPsec? If you did AH first and then ESP, you would have Mac then encrypt, okay? Because AH does Macing, and then you could use ESP in encryption only. And what we did was we broke all possible such configurations of IPsec, okay? Because we wanted to really hammer Bruce into the ground. Right? We, wanted to, we wanted to show that this thinking is completely wrong. And I recommend you read that. There's some cute tricks in that paper to, to make that work. Okay, so uh, the lessons from all of this then, okay, I hope I've demonstrated that encryption on its own does not provide confidentiality in the face of active attacks. In CPA is not enough. You need some kind of integrity. If we'd had AE security, we would have been in good shape. Okay? Here the attacks are exploiting this interaction between crypto and layer, and the layers above. And the final point is that we needed to do practical attacks to convince the experts that they needed to change what they were doing. And we kind of failed because our timing was bad with respect to the, the RFCs, the standardization process. Our timing was slightly off. Okay, so any questions about IPsec? Yes, or? Question. Yeah. When you do the analysis, you said that you can fix some of the problem by checking the policies on the way out. Yeah. But in Tadal mode, when the packet goes in, it should also go through the policy check. In which case, it should <coughs> drop to the security gateway on the way in. No, unfortunately not, because the gateway, until it's done the decryption, doesn't know what's in the inner packet. You can only look at the outer header to make any policy decisions. What it does is it looks in the outer header, it finds this field called the SPI, which is the pointer to the key, and then it decrypts. And then if you take the packet again, go to the SPI to obtain the SPI. It does, exactly, exactly. But Linux didn't do that. That was my point. Also in the incoming, not only in the outcome. In the incoming. Because in the incoming, you take the packet after you decrypt. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And you can do whatever you want. Sure. You should take the packet, go back to the SPI. Absolutely. Then the SPI and verify that this is the correct SPI that you. Right. Because then there are other things. Exactly. And then if the protocol is incorrect. Ah, uh, well, no, because you could have. So this is one of the wonderful things about IPsec policy is it's all configurable, and you could have a policy that applies to all protocols, all upper layer protocols. 
So you, that's actually a, it's called a policy selector for IPsec. You can say, I want this IPsec policy just for TCP or for all upper layer protocols. So we, this would still work if uh, you had a star there for all, all possible protocols. Yeah. But yeah, there is this weird interaction between crypto and policy that you know, I don't want to talk about. Policy, yeah. All these attacks only work with the ICMP idea or are <coughs> other more uh, sophisticated attacks? Um, I think it's unfair, this ICMP that gives everything back. Why is that unfair? <laughs> ICMP is part of IP. IPsec is meant to protect IP, which includes ICMP. So it's an attack on, on the IP layer. No, 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 no. Yeah, there are. You can do things with uh, TCP, SYN packets, and you know, um, playing around with stuff like that. Um, we do some of that in the, in the 2010 paper, checking for acts and so on, to tell you whether something has passed a check or not passed a check. So there's bunches of things you can do. Okay, should we move on? Should we talk about TLS? Any more? Okay, let's do that. So I'm going to talk about particular IVs, TLS, and the beast. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about SSL and TLS first of all at a high <coughs> high level, and this is kind of set up for most of the rest of uh, this talk and the next talk. So SSL was something developed by Netscape in the mid 1990s. This was you know when the internet or the web was taking off. They wanted to enable secure commerce, e-commerce. They want to encrypt our credit card numbers. We need something to do that. SSL was the thing they came up with. SSL v1 was broken at birth, right? It was broken the moment it was presented. SSL v2 uh, was then developed. It's also flawed in various ways that I'm not going to go into. And it's actually now deprecated by the ITF. The ITF says, don't use SSL v2 anymore. But they only just made that decision. Look at the RFC number, right? That's a high number. It's a recent, a recent RFC. It turns out that 27% of all servers on the internet that, that support SSL still support SSL v2. Okay, that's pretty scary. Huh? 27. According to um, uh, SSL Pulse, which is this monthly survey of uh, SSL websites. Okay? But none of your browsers are going to actually select SSL v2 anymore, so you won't end up using it, don't worry. But you should you know, make sure you've checked that box or unchecked that box. SSL v2. SSL v3 is still very widely supported. Uh, and then what happened is uh, IETF took over and they started to standardize uh, SSL. They called it TLS, Transport Layer Security. <clears throat> and there are three different versions of TLS as of now, 1.0, 1.1, 1.2. And these are all kind of tweaks of each other. So TLS 1.0 is basically SSL v3. Uh, 1.1 and 1.2 are kind of little evolutions of TLS 1.0. And the evolutions are there because of attacks. Okay, so you know there was an attack, tweak, another attack, tweak, and eventually, and currently people are talking about TLS 1.3. That's sort of under discussion at the moment. Why does it matter? Why do you? Why should you care? Well, it started off just being about e-commerce, but gradually it's become the de facto secure protocol of choice. So if you're a developer developing an app for Android, say and you want secure communication back to your server because you're encrypting somebody's uh, in-app in purchase information, you're going to use TLS because that's what your library supports. Okay? You're, going to, you're going to just go with that. So, you know, how many of you are using TLS right now? Some of you are on your laptops, right? I bet you're using, I bet he's using TLS right now. Okay? Yeah, he's not even paying attention. He doesn't even know what I'm talking about. So, like, when you download your email from Gmail, Google Mail, you're using TLS. When you log into Facebook, you're using TLS. When you go to your bank online, you're using TLS. Okay, it's everywhere. So we need to understand whether it's secure or not. So here's a very simplified overview. TLS is always run between a client and a server, at least they're called a client and a server. <coughs> and um, it kind of, again, this is really highly simplified, but you have two phases, handshake protocol, and then the record protocol. And the handshake protocol is about authenticating the parties, usually the client to the server and not vice versa, and setting up keys, symmetric keys, which we then use in the record protocol to do encryption and macking and so on. Okay? So typically we run this once, it might use some public key cryptography, some RSA encryption or some Diffie-Hellman key exchange, some complicated messy stuff, and then we have this nice beautiful simple record protocol which is encrypting and macking and that kind of thing. Okay, and what we're going to focus on, because we're a symmetric crypto uh, winter school, is this bit, the record protocol. Okay, uh, what does it provide, this record protocol? 
It provides uh, data origin authentication and integrity using a Mac, confidentiality using a symmetric encryption algorithm. We're also interested in making sure that packets or messages don't get replayed. So we have sequence numbers and we check sequence numbers and we make sure that a packet can't be uh, repeated. We also make sure that packets can't be dropped, that they can't, the order can't be swapped of the packets. Okay? Because we want a nice, clean, secure stream of data from the client to the server or vice versa. <coughs> There's also options for using compression in TLS and also uh, the application layer messages that are getting encrypted can also be fragmented into smaller pieces before they get encrypted. Okay? So there's a lot of stuff going on in there. It's not just encryption and macking. There's these other things too. So here's how it works. In, in the, sort of, uh, the simplified case, there's some additional complexities I'll talk about. So what do you see here? What do you, do you recognize anything from your toolbox? Open your toolbox. What kind of construction do we have? Mac, Mac then encrypt. Right? But it isn't quite Mac then encrypt because we Mac our payload. This is the thing from the application. This is your credit card number, if you like. But there's these other fields here. There's a sequence number, which is 8 bytes long. And there's a header, which is 5 bytes long. 8 plus 5 is 13. You don't get a job for that. 8 plus 5 is 13. There's an attack called Lucky 13. I wonder if there's a connection. OK, yeah, there is. We'll explain later. Um, so it's actually a Mac on some header information and payload. And then we put the Mac on the end, and then we encrypt it. But before we encrypt it, we're going to add some padding. So there's actually an encoding step, which is basically padding, before we do the encryption. OK? Um, your options, well, you basically everything's based on HMAC. OK, that's good. We, we like HMAC. It's a bit slow, but pretty secure. The encryption options are basically these. You can have CBC mode of your favorite block cipher. Uh, we have a paranoid option, and we have an option for people who don't care about speed. <laughs> and you can also have RC4, which is a stream cipher with 128-bit keys. Okay? And in that case, if you use the stream cipher, you don't need the padding. Right? Because stream ciphers don't need, don't need padding. The padding is only there for the CBC mode options, really. Um, and the padding looks like this. You either have uh, a single byte 00, zero which gets you out to the first block boundary, maybe, or 0101, and all the way up to 256 copies of FF hexadecimal. That's interesting. So the padding doesn't have to stop at the first block boundary that you reach. You can add variable amounts of padding. You can have more than one block of padding if you want it. OK? Why might you want that? <coughs> Length hiding. hiding, right? Because now. You're going to encrypt all of this, so maybe if you add some extra padding blocks here, more than you really need, you're going to hide the true length of the payload. Okay? So there's like, uh, so padding started off as something that you need because you're using CBC mode, and you need padding for CBC mode, and then it turned into a security feature, okay, of hiding the length of messages. That's called function creep, <laughs> right? And function creep in, in the crypto world is generally a very bad idea. And here, yeah, it turns out to be a bad thing. Okay, um, how much of this do we need to say? Well, not so much. I think I've said it already. You calculate your Mac on this data, you append the Mac, you pad if you need it, and then you prepend your header. And the header's got some data in it, right? It's got a content type field, who knows what that is. It's got a version number, which is a two byte encoding of which version of TLS you're using. Goodness knows why that's there. And then you have the length of the fragment, which is a two byte field, which tells you how long the rest of this stuff is. Okay, so the, in the header, you have a two-byte field which tells you the total length of the ciphertext. And the header, I think. I think the header is included. Okay. Yes? These 13 bytes are not part of, are not in the message? Um, in this picture, they're not. But in reality, the header is here. Oh, oh no, yeah, this, this picture is correct. You include the header, but not the sequence number. Okay? And the reason you don't include the sequence number is that you're assuming that this ciphertext is going to be sent over TCP. And TCP is reliable. Okay? So the receiver also has a copy of the sequence number. You both start at zero at the start of the connection, once you set up a key. And for every packet you send, you increase the sequence number by one. And for every packet you receive, you increase the sequence number by one. And if the sequence numbers are off because a packet got dropped, well, tough. Something went badly wrong with TCP. 
Okay, but because TCP is reliable, in general, that's not going to happen very often. So we don't need to include the sequence number because we assume that the, the, the protocol over which this is going to be transported is a reliable protocol. <coughs> So when you verify the tag, you add your own sequence number? Absolutely. Great, great point. So in the reverse process, <clears throat> when you, you're going to decrypt this, you're going to try and remove the padding, and then you're going to check the MAC, but you've got to construct the header field to do that. And so you're going to take the header that you got on the wire, and you're going to add your local copy of the sequence number to that when you check the MAC. So if you dropped a packet, you'll end up, if, if the network dropped a packet in between times, you're going to end up using the wrong value of the sequence number to do the verification, and the Mac will fail. And if the Mac fails, it's game over, right? You send an error message and you throw away the keys. Okay? So what that means is that denial of service attacks against TLS are trivial. You just flip a bit somewhere or you drop a packet and you'll cause the keys to be thrown away. Okay? So there's this interaction a little bit between security and denial of service. That's an interesting thing to think about too. Okay. So here's what we do in reverse. This is kind of really going back to, to, to Tal's point. We get our message, our ciphertext, its length is specified in the header, we decrypt it, we remove the padding to recover the payload and the MAC field. We check the MAC on the sequence number, that's the local copy of the sequence number, the header and the payload. We might decompress at this point if uh, we've used the optional compression, and then we'll pass the payload to the upper layer, which is the application. And notice that even though we might have fragmented this payload might be a fragment of a bigger message on the way in. We don't do fragment reassembly on the way out. We just pass back those bytes. Okay? So it's up to the app. So basically the application expects to see a stream of plain text bytes coming at it rather than distinct message boundaries. Okay? That's a detail. And I put this in red because it's important. Errors can arise from any of these decryption, padding removal, and MAC checking steps. Okay? And if you don't carefully hide the source of the error, bad things can happen. So if we go back for a moment to this picture, notice that the MAC is computed on the payload and the header, and then the padding is added. So the padding is not integrity protected. Okay? It's only encrypted. So you have this weird mix where some of the stuff is integrity protected, but some of it is not. Okay? And that, for the attacker, is a great opportunity. He can make bad things happen. And we'll look at that after lunch. You have to wait a bit for lunch, though. We're not quite there yet. Okay. It's worth, it's worth waiting. Because the lunch is going to be good. <laughs> okay. This is about sequence numbers. We talked about this because Tal asked a good question already. Yeah. Quick question. Sure. After the slide in red, you have uh, decryption. Mm -hmm. None of your examples uh, could generate uh, an error on decryption, can they? No. But and in fact, if you look at, for example, the OpenSSL implementation of TLS, the first thing it does in CBC mode is check that the message length is a multiple of the block size. And if it's not, it sends an error message and tears down the connection. So um, that doesn't help an attacker because it doesn't leak anything to him about plain text because he already knows what the ciphertext length is. And you can, you know. But you can, decryption can fail. Okay. I could have missed that out because it doesn't help attackers. The really important ones are padding removal and MAC checking as we'll see. Okay. Uh, I should mention something. I should confess to having lied to you. So this is not the only way you can do encryption in TLS. In TLS 1.2, you can use authenticated encryption schemes or modes. I'm not sure if Tom's going to cover GCN. No, OCB. Yeah, so you'll see something like GCN tomorrow. These are kind of all-in-one modes that do encryption and integrity protection all in one role. They, they provide AEAD, really. Um, but, and support for TLS 1.2 was only recently added to the major browsers. So it was actually, TLS 1.2, remember, was published in 2008. So that's six years ago now, or five, five and a bit years ago. And it was only in November last year that the major browsers, uh, Chrome, etc. I can't remember all their names right now. Mozilla, Internet Explorer, Safari, what's that one? Opera. Opera, which apparently nobody uses, but uh, <laughs> shouldn't really be there across the web. Um, only in November did they all actually start supporting TLS 1.2. Some of them had it already implemented, but switched off. Okay? And the reason that they all started switching on is because of all these attacks I'm going to talk about. Okay? They realized that actually it's time for TLS 1.2, because these AE schemes are kind of immune to the attacks I'm going to talk about. You were talking about November 13th? Yeah. November 13th? Yeah, like three months ago, two months ago. 
Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so we had it for five, six years, but nobody was using it. One of the reasons that nobody was using it is because none of the servers supported it. So even if the clients had switched it on, the servers wouldn't be able to talk it, talk back to them. Okay, so there's this kind of lock between who's going to go first, the clients or the servers. Nobody wanted to go first because there's no advantage to going first, unless the other guy is prepared to do it at the same time. So this is from SSL Pulse. This is a few months old now. This shows you the support on the top uh, 200,000 websites that support SSL, according to Alexa, some, some ranking system for websites. And you see the support levels for different versions. So SSL version 2 is still 27%. And then the, the adoption of 1.1 and 1.2 is pretty low on the server side. It's like below 20%. Okay? And this num these numbers are creeping up by about 1% per month. So in eight years from now, okay, all servers will be supporting TLS 1.1 and 1.2. I think it should go faster than that, actually. Kenny? According yeah. to Adam Langley, they, he, he claims they tried to implement actually TLS 1.2 earlier yeah. in servers, in their servers, but because of implementation bugs in many of the SSL deployed implementations in the browsers, a lot mm -hmm. of them broke. Yep. So when they tried to do it first, they actually caused problems. It caused problems, so they had to switch back off again. Well, they did testing, actually, and then never deploy it. And it's also true that there are these things called middle boxes which are devices sitting in the middle of the network that try to do stuff, you know, packet inspection and things like that. And they, they also don't like TLS 1.2, because there's lots of, lots of breakage. Tom? Is it default that they start with TLS 1.2 when they do connections? These guys? Support is different. Uh, out of the box, yeah, yeah, the default now is 1.2 for most of these browsers. So there's another issue, which, yeah, I really don't have time to get into, but it's kind of fascinating. The negotiation of which version you're using is not secure. <laughs> so a man in the middle attacker can change your 1.2 request into a 1.0 request, right? And you can end up, you know, falling back. Map everything back? Huh? The anti protocol map everything, no? Yeah, but there are some subtleties. There's some subtleties. So um, I could just send you a spoofed server hello saying, sorry, I don't speak that version of TLS. Okay, the rest of the handshake doesn't complete, so you never get to the client finish and the server finish. And the you never get to authenticate that view because you gave up early. So now the client will try with TLS 1.0. You say, sorry, I don't speak TLS 1.0 either, and then you end up back at SSL v3. Okay, so you can always push clients back. It's nasty, right? It's really, the real world is really nasty. Right? It's so just, as far as the browser is willing to go. So v, v3 normally, right? Depends what boxes you checked in your configuration. Yeah. Usually the browser is sending the entire list of these supports. No, not for TLS version numbers. For cipher suites, yes. That's a different thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, version, version numbers and cipher suites are orthogonal to each other in TLS. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, good. Okay, so there is this thing called authenticated encryption. We can get it. And now if you log into Facebook, you will get TLS 1.2 if you're using a modern browser. So we're getting there, but it's taken a hell of a long time to get. Okay, uh, oh gosh, there's so much stuff to say about TLS. Well, there's lots of extensions of TLS um, because people want to do all kinds of different things with it. There's also DTLS, which is a really cute protocol. It's basically TLS running over UDP instead of over TCP, okay? And uh, there's some changes you have to make because UDP is unreliable by, by definition. So you have to be error tolerant in DTLS. And that means you have to make changes to the handshake protocol and also changes to the record protocol and the way that you handle errors. One change in particular is really nice. Um, if, you, if DTLS encounters an error during cryptographic processing, it does not tear down the connection and throw away the keys. Because it might just be an accident. Or maybe we lost a packet. It keeps going. It stays alive. This is great news if you're an attacker, right? Because it means you can send cyber texts that you've concocted, that you've made up, and it's not the case that for every packet you send, you're going to get a Mac failure and you lose your connection. Connections stay alive. That makes attacks much easier. But we might have time to see that later on. Okay, uh, why am I showing this? I don't know. Okay. Um, oh, what about theory? What does theory tell us? Well, we're using Mac and Encrypt uh, with associated data, so it's not quite as simple as you might think. And this is not generically secure, right? We know this from Blair and Ampenfree. We do get NP text and NCPA security, and uh, you can use this paper from Hugo Kratchik from 2001 that says, ah, you know, if it's CBC mode, 
then you can get uh, you can get CCA security or AE actually. Okay, if it's CBC mode, you can extend this to the stateful setting. And actually, this also holds if you use RC4, the RC4 stream cipher, under the assumption that RC4 is output is pseudo random. Okay, somebody told me Addy was going to come today. Is he? He's not here, is he? Well, Addy Shamir and uh, uh, Mantan showed in 2002 that the output of RC4 is not pseudo random. But you might wonder how does that translate? Does that translate into an attack? And we'll, we'll see later. I hope it does. Okay. So are we done, right? Are we done? Because we've got this nice theoretical support that tells us, you know, it's going to be okay. Well, here's the thing. Kravchik's analysis assumes that it, you have random IVs for CBC mode, and in the early versions of TLS and NCL, you don't. You have chained initialization vectors. Okay, that might be problematic. Um, TLS is not really using Mac then encrypt. It's using Mac then encode then encrypt and with a specific padding scheme for the encryption, for the encoding step. And decryption can fail in more than one way. So potentially, you have different failure symbols, different error messages that can come out of the decryption process. Maybe explicitly different error messages, or maybe you can time the decryption process and, and learn something about what happened during decryption. Okay? So the theory doesn't quite match here with the practice. Um, in fact, if you look carefully at Hugo's paper, there's no padding anywhere in his analysis. Okay? The data is assumed to be block aligned and the max size is equal to the block size. Um, and what we know is from the construction is that the padding is not integrity protected. So there's a field that doesn't arise in the analysis, in the security analysis, and it's not integrity protected in reality. So you should be worried about that. Right? The things that are not integrity protected we know are, are, are you know, potentially dangerous. And of course we know that RC4 has weaknesses. Uh, although, really, until recently, people didn't really know how to exploit that to do anything interesting. Okay, <clears throat> so what I'm going to show, really, is that these gaps between what the theory says and what actually happens in reality really do matter in terms of finding attacks. Okay, so let's look at this first attack, and I'll try and do this before lunch because it's really quite easy, uh, and then we'll stop for lunch. So there's a really simple chosen plaintext distinguishing attack against TLS if you have IV chaining. Remember what IV chaining is? Can anybody remind us what IV chaining is? Using the last block encrypted in last time for the IV. For the next IV. Use the last block from the previous ciphertext as the next IV. Okay? So actually, it was Phil Rogaway who realized or <coughs> noted you know, as a triviality, actually, in 95 that this was a problem, that this attack was possible. It then took nine years until people noticed that this might apply to TLS. Diane Moller pointed this out. And then actually Greg Bard had a couple of papers that are not very well known, um, where he extended this to a theoretical plain text recovery attack. So a distinguishing attack became a plain text recovery attack, in theory. And then in 2011, so this is fully 16 years after Phil's observation, <coughs> this was turned into a practical plain text recovery attack on HTTP cookies. Okay, so these are little tokens that you send across your secure channel, which enable you to authenticate yourself, right? They authenticate one end of a connection to another over, over uh, HTTP. And this work was done by Dong and Rizzo. And they're not even cryptographers. And I don't mean that in an insulting way, right? <laughs> I mean that in a really positive way. Here are guys coming from like what you might call the, the hacker community, showing us how to break our protocols, right? You should pay attention to that. That means we're not doing our job properly as cryptographers if we have to rely on these guys to do it for us. Okay? And they came up with this thing called the Beast, and what they did, which was really cool, was they, they had a black hat uh, demo, and they showed how to hack into PayPal. They showed their attack live, hacking into PayPal, and getting access to somebody's account. One of their own accounts, of course, they didn't, you know, <laughs> at least not as far as we know, attack into his real account. And that got people's attention. A video on YouTube is a really great way of getting people's attention, and a good name. So this is a demonstration that attacks do get better, but it's a 16-year demonstration. It took a long time to go from theory to a practical attack. <clears throat> so how does it work? Well, okay, it's a chosen plaintext distinguishing attack. So let's suppose we have two plaintexts, P0 and P1, and we want to distinguish their encryptions. And we're going to make things simple. We're going to assume that everything is a single block, just, just for now. So all of our messages are single block messages. We're in CBC mode. So what we know, 
is that uh, the attacker is going to make a left or right encryption query in our model for these pair of messages, P0, P1, and PB is going to get encrypted. And what we want to do is the attacker is figure out the value of B, right? What We're doing a distinguishing. Right? Sorry? What is left or right? What is left or right? What is left or right? Zero one. Zero one. <laughs> yeah? Do you remember the model? Who, who's asking okay. that question? That's fine. Okay, good. Remember the NCPA model? We're, we're in the NCPA model. Okay, yeah? good. <clears throat> so the attacker is going to get some ciphertext block C1, okay, which is the encryption of PB using C0. We don't care about C0. It's the previous, it's the last block of the previous ciphertext. Okay? Now what happens is the following. We know that C1 is going to be used as the IV for the next encryption. Yes? So now the attacker makes a left or right query on a single block P0, XOR, C0, XOR, C1. So what this means is he makes the left message and the right message equal to each other. He's allowed to do that. There's nothing in the model that says he can't make the left and the right message equal. And he chooses this rather clever message here, and he's going to get back a ciphertext block C2. Okay, now, we have to analyze this. If, let's see, uh, jumping the slide, if PB here, was actually P0, so P was 0, then look what happens here. Then here the input to EK is P0 XOR C0, and here the input to EK is P0 XOR C0 XOR C1 XOR C1. So it's P0 XOR C0 again. So if the encrypted message was P0, the inputs to the block cipher are the same. So what? And the inputs are the same. So C1 equals C2. So if the plain text value was P0 here, then C1 equals C2. And you can also show that if uh, PB was P1, then because the block cipher is a permutation, then C1 is not equal to C2. So because you knew the IV that was going to be used, C1, you could choose a plain text carefully, ahead, you know, after having seen C1, choose a plain text, get it encrypted, and then you have a test on whether this block was P0 or P1. It's trivial, right? I mean, it's just you just have to understand C CBC more than that. No, no offense to, to Phil Ruggle, of course. It's, I don't think he claimed it was a big attack. It's just like, you need your IVs to be random. If the attacker knows what the IV is going to be, C1, he can play this game. Okay? So we've broken CBC mode with non-random predictable IVs. Yeah? So we shouldn't be using this in TLS, right? Because we have an attack. Yeah, but you know the practitioner view? It's only a chosen plain text attack that allows you to break indistinguishability. Where's my plain text? Show me my plain text. And anyway, how do you realize that funny left or right oracle? How do you get your chosen plain text encrypted? Right? It's somehow, you know, it doesn't feel <coughs> realistic as an attack. <clears throat> okay. Um, of course, the attack extends to multi block messages, right? You just, you know, you just have to make your, your pictures bigger. I'm too lazy to draw big pictures, so you only get one block from me. So it's theory, it's broken. How do we turn it into a real attack? Well, here's, here's the beast part one. So this is what Duong and Ritzel did now. Let's assume, for a moment, that we know all but one byte of the block that we're trying to decrypt. Uh, sorry, that we're trying to uh, recover, okay? so. Here's a block, P0, P14, P15. So we're assuming AES, right? And each of these is a byte. We have 16 byte blocks. Um, and we see the encryption C1. We know P0 through P14, and we'd like to figure out what P15 is. So we know all but one byte of our block, okay? So this is like a partially known plaintext attack now, okay? Not a, not a chosen plaintext attack, but a partially known plaintext. So why don't we use P0 through P14 as the first 14 bytes of P dashed, and then we iterate over all 256 possible values in position 15 in P dashed. Okay, so we, we put P0 to P14 there, and then we put a chosen byte as the last byte, and we get it encrypted. Okay, so we do 256 trials, and if we happen to set P dash 15 to equal P15, then C1 will equal C2. And that's an if and only if, okay? So just to repeat, we, we don't know this byte, we'd like to find it. We know P0 through P14. So we cook up this plaintext block in the chosen plaintext attack with P-dash's first 15 bytes 
being, I should say first 15 bytes there, sorry, that's a typo. The first 15 bytes of p dash are p0 through p14, and we make a guess for the last byte. If we guess correctly, then we get this lovely equation again, and here we have p x or c0, and here we would also have p x or c0, and c1 would equal c2. And if we guess wrongly, c1 will not equal c2. So if we do 256 trials, we can recover p15, assuming we know the previous trials. And this is basically, you can always do this. this is always, there's always a way of turning a chosen plain text attack into a low entropy plain text recovery attack, assuming there's low entropy in the unknown part of the, of the plain text. So on average, you need 128 trials, worst case, 256. Okay, that's part one. Now here's part two. Let's assume the attacker can now control the position of the unknown bytes in the stream with respect to the CBC block boundaries. What does that mean? Well, let's suppose uh, these bytes are all known, the green ones, and then T0 through T5 here are the target bytes in red. Okay? And now what we've assumed is the attacker can align things so that uh, P0 is in the first byte of a block, and the first target byte is at the last byte of a block. Okay, and I'm going to explain in a moment how you can achieve this. Okay, so now we run the attack, and we recover T0. Okay, 256 trials, worst case. And now what the attacker does is he slides the bytes. Okay, I'll just do that again, because it took some effort to get this PowerPoint to work. There you go. Right, I have to use my animations carefully. So we've slid everything. We now know T0, we just recovered it in the previous iteration, and now we have one more unknown byte in our block. We recover T1, and we slide, and we go on and on and on. Okay, so if you have sufficient control over the position of the unknown bytes, you can introduce one new unknown byte for each iteration of the attack, and byte by byte you can recover the point text. Yeah, it's kind of simple. Uh, okay, so now part three, and this is the really funky bit. How do you realize these capabilities as an attacker, right? You need the ability to inject blocks, chosen blocks of point text, into a TLS connection, just after, just at the start of a, of a message. And you also need the ability to shift the bits around, shift the bytes around, okay? And you also need some known plain text to get you started. You, you need to know 15 bytes of one block before you can even start the whole process. <coughs> well, if you're attacking a cookie in HTTP, you know what these bytes are, because they're always fixed. It's something like HTTP cookie equals Okay? It's stereotypical. It's defined by the HTTP protocol. And then what follows is the cookie, the bytes that you don't know. Right? So in fact, in real protocols like HTTP, you always have some known plaintext. And in this case, you have enough to fill up your block, at least until the last position. Yeah? So we can realize that requirement. Now what they did was, this is the really clever bit, I think. So here's the target that we'd like to get. It's a cookie. Now for the mathematicians in the audience, it's not a real cookie in the browser. Right? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, my PhD is in mathematics, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm taking the mickey out of myself as well. It's a sequence of bytes, and this is what we'd like to get. And it's deep in the browser where the attacker, the attacker can't see it. Okay? So what he does is he, he, uh, he's managed to take over this website. So this is, here's Alice in her lunch break, and she's actually surfing the web to find, I don't know, uh, a knitting pattern, say. Okay? And this is knitting.com, and it's been taken over by the attacker. So when Alice visits that site, what happens is that the attacker manages to download JavaScript code into Alice's browser. So now the attacker is somehow inside the browser, running code in the browser. But it's in this little compartment, and it still can't get at the cookie, because there's kind of isolation between this, this JavaScript running here and what's actually in the browser. Okay, the browser has got some decent level of security. But still, because this website was, was malicious, the attacker is now in the browser. Okay, what happens next? Well, is uh, that now Alice goes to visit her bank through some other tab in the browser, and a TLS tunnel gets established. And automatically, oh, we also assume the, brow the, the attacker's here. The attacker's everywhere, actually, in these attacks, right? So he, he's in the browser somehow in a tab running JavaScript, but he's also able to monitor the TLS connection between the client and the server. So now, when Alice connects to her, her bank website, the cookie is automatically attached by the browser 
in the plain texts. Okay, that are sent across. For every request that Alice's browser sends, the cookie is attached to the request. That's just the way the web browser works. Okay? So now what the attacker does is he makes his own requests from his JavaScript to the remote website, to the banking website. Every request he makes, the cookie will also be attached. Okay? Now there's something a bit fishy here because he's running in a different tab in the browser. And uh, his code came from this website, and now he's access accessing that website. There's a whole bunch of browser stuff going on here to do with something called same origin policy, which same origin policy. How, how does it it's CSRA. It's CSRA. Yeah, you can do it. Is the CSRA. Yeah. yeah, there's a bunch. Of, so in 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 the paper. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So because of the what's called cross site request something forgery you don't yeah you don't get the reply but in fact for the attack you don't need the reply yeah, exactly. okay because you just need to see the ciphertext yeah. okay now there's a whole bunch of complexity around here and Duong and Rizzo never really wrote their research paper up there's a half written research paper on the internet called here come the XOR ninjas okay if you want to find it you can google for here come the XOR ninjas a ninja is like a, you know, a Chinese warrior with magical powers that's that's what they were calling themselves I guess <coughs> Uh, and they actually put an XOR symbol in the title of their paper. And I, that, my theory is it never got published because none of the publishers would allow them to have an XOR in, their, <laughs> in the title. Anyway. Mm. So now we're almost there. So we have the JavaScript here is going to make lots of uh, HTTP requests to this, remote web, to this remote website. The cookie is going to get attached over and over again. And now what the attacker needs to do is somehow get his block in, as the first block in, in each message that gets sent. Okay, and that's actually quite difficult to do from JavaScript, so they had to have some, some tricks for that. Um, and also the attacker can pad its HTTP requests to move the bytes around. So you just put random white space into the, into the request that you make to get the cookie aligned exactly where you want it, so that you get this kind of situation back here, where the first byte of the cookie is the last byte of a block that you're injecting. Okay, Yehuda. So the error message is coming back from the server, they don't... <coughs> well, there are no error messages because what gets sent across here are perfectly valid TLS messages. Okay. No, but the application level. I mean, the, 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 oh. The, uh, something is being sent to the yeah. Bank, right? the bank so, to so they will come back to the attacker. Oh, they go okay. The and he just he just he just ignores them. So the TLS is finished. At yeah, the that's true. The cookies are wrong, so the server will drop the... Uh, yeah, 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 it's true, it's true. So the, the request will be dropped by the server. Uh, not the at the TOS layer, but at the application. That, that's why the TLS yeah. layer doesn't get to a problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, and the attacker isn't actually manipulating any ciphertext here. It's a passive attack as far as this guy is concerned. But he does have to be able to communicate backwards and forwards with this guy here, because he has to be able to tell him, okay, now slide the plain text and try the next byte, because I've got that byte. So maybe he has to communicate with this web server, which then communicates with this JavaScript, which then does the business. It's kind of tricky, right? And you can see why you need to be a bit of a hacker with really good website or web HTTP, HTTP skills to make this kind of thing work. But the bottom line is it works, okay? That, there's a bunch of text there. The summary is it's complicated, but you can make it work. And actually these techniques turn out to be really useful later because it gives you a way of generating traffic, TLS traffic, getting the same thing encrypted over and over again. And that's really useful if you're someone like me. Okay, what was the impact? I'm coming right to the end now of this, of this section. Well, it was a big headache for TLS vendors. Most client implementations at this time were stuck at TLS 1.0, so they were using chained IDs. The best solution would have been to switch to 1.1 or 1.2, because then you don't have chained IVs, they have random IVs. In fact, the reason they have random IVs is because people took the the people who write the standards took the Rogaway distinguishing attack seriously enough. So they were ahead of the, the curve here in terms of adapting the, 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 uh, the standard. The problem was that uh, nobody was using TLS 1.1 or 1.2. Everybody was using TLS 1.0, even though the fix was already there. You could do other hacks as well, and everybody did this because they weren't ready to switch to 1.1 or 1.2. So you can use some trick called record splitting which basically hides the IV from the attacker until it's too late. Okay, or you could switch to using RC4. And a lot of experts said this at the time, <coughs> to their great embarrassment now, okay? Because it turns out that RC4 is also bad, as, as hopefully we'll get there later. Um, 
So this is interesting from a cultural perspective. Okay, as cryptographers, we say, oh, we always knew this was bad, and we know that RC4 is not great, don't use it. But people do what's pragmatic, right? They do what they can to avoid these attacks. Okay, so finishing up with some lessons. So here, there's a theoretical vulnerability that was pointed out in 95, 16 years later, it became a practical attack. The practitioners in this case were listening to the theoreticians because they fixed TLS 1.1 and 1.2, but the problem is nobody was using those versions, right? We were stuck at 1.1. And this is a point that I really want to make uh, to leave you with a bit of a, a, bit of a kind of a pistol shot to the head. Crypto cryptographers didn't make these attacks practical. Hackers did, right? People who are experts in web technology and so on. Um, the man in the browser idea using JavaScript. Um, and, you know, I think that if we want to really get our work understood as, as cryptographers and really make a difference to the world, maybe we have to engage a little bit more with this community. Some of us, some of us already do, some people already do. I can see Orr either nodding or shaking his head, I'm not sure what he's thinking. Um, <clears throat> and then the importance of doing some good marketing for your attack, right? Having the YouTube video that steals PayPal cookies is, is pretty impressive.